For those of you who are recurring delegates at Outlook, you'll know that I usually present the wool and the cotton outlook. This year, though, we thought we'd have a bit of a rethink on how it was structured because of the ongoing dynamics that we've been following within the industry over the past four or five years. And these changing dynamics have come about because of sustained high meat prices. At the same time, dry seasonal conditions have forced the hand of many producers, leading to higher than expected turnoff. And then we have had high export demand, which has kept prices high. So the consequence has been not only a shrinking of the national flock, but also in the number of breeding ewes, while at the same time a bit of a change in the composition of some breeding flocks. And with that all going on, and, and as a bit of a backdrop to my presentation, what I'd like to do today is shape my presentation first by looking at some of the economic drivers behind my Outlook presentation this year, and then to follow that with a bit of a discussion on where we see the industries going over the medium term and some of the issues behind those forecasts. So let's turn to some of the economic drivers. On the demand side, things are looking relatively favorable for both industries. We've got an assumption of world economic growth with gradual strengthening of demand coming out of the United States, stronger consumer demand, which should help the demand for wool um, from China. We have positive growth from the Middle East and from China, which should help our demand for sheep meat. The exchange rate is assumed to be lower this year, which makes Australian commodities relatively less expensive on the world market. Three FTAs have been negotiated over the past couple of years. Two have already entered into force, and that with Korea and with Japan, and the third agreement with China is assumed to come into force late this year or early next year. And that should have some positive influence on strengthening of demand for sheep meat, but that's more towards the end of the medium term and beyond. One of the downside risks we've identified really relates to wool and its competitiveness with synthetic fibers, and I'll be touching on that in more detail later on. Turning now to the supply side, two years ago, dry seasonal conditions over most of the East Coast led to a very high turnoff. Last year, although seasonal conditions were better on average, there were certain parts of the country like Queensland and Victoria and northern New South Wales, which again had very dry conditions and again had another year of high turnoff. Since that time, there's been some good summer rains and some renewed optimism about the outlook period, but there's definitely been an impact over the last few years in terms of that contraction of the national flock. So what does that mean in terms of prices? Well, if you've got lower supply and you've got strengthening or stronger demand, that usually means to have a much positive outlook for prices, and indeed, that is what we're seeing in a nutshell. So I'll just stop there with the economic side of things and turn our attention now to some of the changes that we've seen over the past 15 years in terms of relative returns to the two industries. For a long time, producers have been weighing up the relative returns from producing meat versus wool. And of course, factors have depended on the properties and the situation, the topography of each individual's property. Now what I've represented here is the average returns per sheep divided up between the gross value production from wool production and the gross value production from meat production. And what you can see is in the early 2000s, the returns from wool production dominated the total GVP per sheep. Gradually, over the decade, we had weak wool prices in the middle of the decade and strengthening sheep prices. And then we had just stronger sheep prices relative to wool prices. And you can see by the green line, which is the share of GVP to sheep to the total, that the returns from sheep meat exceeded 50%, and they've remained there, more or less, since about 2008-09. So with relatively sh strong sheep prices since 0809, and no signals for any ebbing of demand anytime soon, we know that some producers have re-examined their business models and have made changes to take advantage of this shift in relative prices and to become more flexible and to become more responsive to changes in market forces. We also know from industry discussions that there's been some shifting in that composition of the breeding core of the flocks to incorporate a larger proportion of first cross merinos, again being able to be more responsive to ongoing price signals. Now that response to higher prices we've seen over the last few years has led to higher turnoff and higher slaughter, so I'll turn our attention to that now. For those of you who attended the meat session yesterday, this graph was presented by my colleague Trish Gleason. As I've highlighted here, you can see that record lamb slaughter in the past two years, and including the forecast for this year, is expected to lead to, well, we've had high slaughter over the past three years, and at the same time, we've had increasing prices. And the reason is because of strong export demand. Australia doesn't just produce for itself, it produces for 
a much larger market. And that strength of demand is just continuing to push upward prices. Now, there's a situation where the availability of supply has fallen, and when you combine that with a lower Australian dollar, we're forecasting that prices again will be higher. On the sheep side of things, higher turnoff has really been a reflection of the difficult seasonal conditions. But average sale yard prices have also remained relatively favorable. But with that high turnoff, we're looking at a flock size coming in at the end of this financial year at about 70.7 .7 million sheep. That's not the lowest on record. Back in about 10-11, the ABS had 68 million sheep, which I was around for discussions about the accuracy of that number. And that being as it may, Certainly what we saw in the years that followed was a pretty strong return in the rebuilding of the flock. And indeed, our medium-term forecast, which is based on the assumption of improved seasonal conditions for at least the next two or three years, is predicated on a rebuilding of the flock again. Now that pace of rebuilding that we're forecasting will be tempered by the high sheep meat prices that we expect to continue over the medium term. So will producers, how producers decide to balance turnoff to take advantage of prices now versus rebuilding their flocks to where they were even a few years ago, that's going to be the, the balancing act, the juggling act that we're going to be watching more closely. And that's what's going to temper growth out over the medium term. So I keep mentioning the strength of export demand and export markets how, and how important they've been to sheep meat prices. I've represented here the volume of exports. Lamb exports to our major trading countries, which include the United States, China, and the Middle East, have all grown significantly over the past five, six years. Just focusing for a minute on the demand from China, it has really taken off over the past five years, given a number of the themes that we've heard about throughout this conference. The increase in urban population, increasing incomes, and a greater demand for meat protein. And that demand is not expected to wane anytime soon. Now China imports about a third, 40% of their sheep meat from us, and the remainder basically from New Zealand. New Zealand is more competitive in China than we are because they succeeded in achieving a free trade agreement in 2008. So the existing tariffs are between 12 and 23%, depending on the type of meat, whether it's chilled or frozen. Um, they've been coming off since that time for New Zealand, and New Zealand will be subject to zero tariffs by next year. Over that same period, Australian sheep meat has been subject to those tariffs, and yet we have still benefited from that strong import demand growth out of China. Should the CHAFTA come into effect at the end of this year, this year or early next year, those tariffs will start to come down, and they will be zero in eight years' time. And that's when really we'll be on a level playing field with New Zealand. Starting next year and over the next couple of years, we're forecasting a bit of a slowdown in the rate of export growth, given our forecast of flock rebuilding and the, hence lower turnoff. Exports to China, Middle East, and the US are still expected to climb gradually, but what really is going to be more variable is our exports to our other markets. Like Japan and Korea, we export a bit there, Malaysia and Hong Kong. Over the medium term, as we expect the flock size to rebuild, slaughter will pick up and exports to those markets will resume more strongly. To stop there on the sheep side and turn our attention now to wool. And of course, given what I've said about the contraction of the flock, it will come as no surprise to you that we're forecasting wool production to be about 4% lower this year compared to last. And that's not just because of the lower number of sheep shorn, but it also is because of lower fleece weights this year given poor pasture conditions through much of the wool producing country. That decline will continue into next year before only gradually increasing as the flock rebuilds. As for prices, the Easter market indicator price this year is forecast to be a little bit lower. That's really driven by what we saw in the first half of the year when weak demand out of China for our wool caused prices to fall by about 5%. And even though we've seen a strengthening since about through January, February, we don't forecast those stronger prices to really offset what happened in the first half of the year. Next year, that lower Australian dollar and the assumed strengthening of demand out of the US and maybe a little bit from the European Union should serve to lift the Easter market indicator price a bit. Over the medium term, real prices are expected to remain relatively steady, but as the flock size increases and wool production comes down, in real terms, we're expecting the price to come back just slightly. Now, I'd like to say a word or two on that importance of the lower Australian dollar because it has really played, sorry about that. It's really played an important role in uh, what's been going on in terms of returns to producers over the last uh, eight months. And what I've represented here is the EMI in US dollars and Australian dollars. And you can see that when the dollar was at about parity, those two prices tracked along pretty much together. 
Looking at just this financial year, you see that the Australian dollar has been falling quite, quite, quite quickly. And at the same time, you've seen that spread between the US price in which trade takes place and the Australian price. And it's that gap that has been caused by the depreciation of the Australian dollar, which has really insulated Australian wool exporters from that weak demand in the first half of this year. Otherwise, the returns to producers would have been significantly lower. So that is a real good visual on how much of a benefit that lower Australian dollar is to us in terms of export returns. So who's buying the wool and where is it going? We export about 95% of what we produce, and China accounts for about 75% to 80% of our exports. It means China continues to be our main export market, and we are dependent upon it. Although we do have some smaller markets, like Italy, India, and the Czech Republic, and there's also been reports in the media about the developments in markets like Russia and Vietnam, and that's Jimmy Jackson's area of expertise. This year, based on lower production, we're expecting exports to fall slightly, and export returns to also fall given the fall in the Eastern market indicator price. Next year, the story is similar with lower production, although with higher prices, it'll serve just to keep price, uh, the, the returns a little bit higher. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, I mentioned there was one element on the demand side that is having a bit of a negative effect or a mitigating effect on how much upswing we can expect from the Eastern market indicator price, given some of the positive influences stemming from supply and the lower dollar. And that has to do with competitiveness with synthetic fibers. In recent years, wool has become increasingly a niche product, a high-value product, used in high-value textiles and clothing. Synthetic fibers, and to a lesser extent cotton, they really dominate fiber consumption. Now, although current manufacturing technologies allow substitution between different fibers, for wool it's really contained within that medium micron range. Synthetic fibers are made from refined petroleum, and so their prices are linked with what's happening to world oil prices. And that sharp fall that we are experiencing in world oil prices are gradually coming over into, what synthetic price, into synthetic prices. And with the possibility of sustained oil prices over the next few years, it can be assumed that that's going to have make synthetic fibers more competitive relative to wool, and that could dampen demand for medium micron fibers, which could put a bit of a mitigating factor on how much the, the, that Eastern market indicator price will increase because it is a weighted average price. As for cotton, prices over the next few years are also expected to be lower given the policies in China and their stockpiling policy. So again, this story is similar in terms of wool's competitiveness with cotton over the next few years. So I'll just summarize the main message coming out of my overview today, and that is assuming more favorable conditions over the next couple of years, we're expecting turnoff to decline as we enter a, a rebuilding phase. In the short term, prices for meat and wool are both expected to rise given the constrained supp supplies and a lower Australian dollar. Over the medium term, as the flock rebuilds and we see higher slaughter and increased wool production, we'll see prices in real terms coming back slightly. Thank you very much.